Ooh, another white boy with a podcast. Pronouns, Jim Bro. Another white boy with a podcast. Do you want to see the video? It went viral. Hi, Gains Gurus, and welcome to TMGP, the Muscle Growth Podcast, Episode 11. I am your host, Roscoe, and today we are welcoming Jake Remit onto the show. Jake has a BS Honours in Exercise Science and is a Certified Strength and Conditioning Specialist. He is currently a researcher, lecturer, and PhD candidate at Florida Atlantic University, where he is working in the Muscle Physiology Laboratory. Here, his research focuses on optimizing program design to maximize hypertrophy and strength. Jake is also a coach with Data Driven Strength, where he provides educational services and one on one coaching for clients with goals ranging from elite powerlifting performance and competitive bodybuilding to recreational strength, muscle growth, and fat loss. He is a competitor himself as well with nearly 10 years of training experience and multiple competitions under his belt. In today's episode, we can look forward to insights from Jake related to programming and using data-driven techniques to drive strength and hypertrophy gains. Given that brief glimpse into Jake's remarkable background, let's jump right into the show. We are, uh, as we said right before we hopped on here, we're busy. Lab stuff is busy. Um, probably talk about some of that stuff here today, but um, overall, man, very good and happy to be busy. Good. That's awesome. Can you give me a brief introduction into yourself, please, and how you got into the world of uh, powerlifting, coaching, and research? Yeah. So um, I guess I'll start a uh, quick bio i guess would be sort of two main things uh one is i'm currently a phd candidate here at florida atlantic university uh, my primary advisor is dr mike zordos who some of your listeners may be aware of he's uh, done a lot of work in the space is one of the main uh, contributors to the research review mass very very great scientist great guy so I'm, I'm very happy to be, be able to learn from him. But um, yeah, so that, that's where a, a lot of my time is spent here in the lab doing research stuff. And then uh, and most of that research focusing primarily primarily these days on hypertrophy, but uh, we've done some work in strength as well and, and trying to look at program design and how to really manipulate things to get the best possible you know strength and hypertrophy outcomes. And then, so that's kind of one hat that I wear. And then the other hat is the sort of coach content creator stuff with uh, data-driven strength where uh, we coach really a, a huge range these days, right? It started out as a lot of powerlifters, but now it's it's a lot of powerlifters and it's a lot of sort of um, more general, you know, strength and body composition change stuff. And it's also some bodybuilders now. And uh, so it's expanded, which I love, right? I, I love being able to have my hands in all of it. And uh, so, that, so that's super fun. So that's uh, another big big uh, time commitment there is the coaching aspect and then you know trying to put some content out there on the internet to hopefully uh be helpful to some degree anyway and spread the knowledge i love to hear which of those groups that you mentioned um would be your favorite from the powerlifting the bodybuilding the lifestyle oh man honestly this is gonna sound like a cop-out answer but i i love all of them pretty much the same because they're so different right like they're so uh and I say this to my clients too, like it's, it's fun to have different conversations with different people. Like the powerlifters, there's like, there's that, like you, you have to go out and take what you want to an extent, right? Like there's a, obviously auto regulation. You have to listen to your body. We have to do all these things, but there, there's much more of that, like, I don't know, primal energy sometimes of like, we trained for this, we're prepared for this. We're going to attempt this PR. It seems realistic. Now we got to go for it. Right. And that's really fun. Uh, competition's really fun bodybuilding is different right it's it's a different energy it's it's more uh endurance you know how much can you really get in there and and feel these feelings and and still show up and do what you got to do still check your boxes um so that's really fun there's a lot of uh i find very like philosophical things wrapped up into bodybuilding especially the dieting aspect um and there's more nutrition stuff going on there too right and then uh, at least usually I think powerlifters would do well to pay more attention to their nutrition. But um, anyway, and then the, the more lifestyle stuff is, is super fun too, right? Because then there are people who you can have conversations about other things that they're not quite as, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? 
it, it's not optimal results at all costs for them, right? It's much more into the flow of the rest of their life. And, and I think that uh, that's just how most people are, right? That's that's the reality for most people. And that's awesome. And, and it's fun to have those other kind of conversations too. So there's my cop out answer without picking an actual favorite. No, no, that's a great answer. It's so funny that you mentioned about the powerlifting and the diet. I had um, Ashley Hoyt, uh, the world's strongest female equipment bench on the show. And uh, her diet, that was episode four, her diet was uh, whatever her kids felt like eating. Yeah. <laughs> that's funny. I mean, that's probably what a lot of people have, right? <laughs> but she's like 317.5 kilogram bench. So gnarly. That, uh, I can't that, even yeah. fathom. Yeah. yeah. Me neither. Me neither. But anyway, back back to you. Sorry. I just thought that that was an interesting no, no. point you made about the pilots yeah. there. Can you tell us a little bit about your PhD research? Yeah. So um, I'll, go, I'll, I'll start kind of broad, I guess. And then if we want to get into more details, then we can do that. But broadly, it's focusing on, really, it's focusing on training volume. And there's a couple pieces with that, right? One piece is as a lab, as a group, this isn't just me, as a group, we are doing, uh, working on updating meta-analysis of the impact of volume on hypertrophy and strength, uh, looking at that dose-response relationship, and which is interesting in a couple ways. One is just because we've had more research come out in the last few years, right, that an update on that is probably, uh, you know, very useful at this point. The The one that Schoenfeld et al. did was back in 2017, right? And it's 2024 now. So uh, we have some stuff, especially some really high volume stuff that'll be interesting to wrap in there. But there's also, um, you know, different ways to analyze things so we can look at things, you know, um, in, in, in terms of like how many sets are being done, like the, the Schoenfeld meta-analysis looked at sort of categorically breaking up volume. So it was five or less or less than five sets, five to nine sets and 10 plus. Uh, what, what we'll do is looking at it more continuously to be able to get, you know, a, a little bit different look at that relationship. So that'll be cool. And there's a lot of little sub analyses that we, that we'll do as well. Um, so I'm really excited for that. Um, so we'll, we'll be able to have that. We'll be able to, um, also look at similar things, similar questions, similar relationships, but rather than total weekly volume, look at the procession volume. And I think that's, you know, a, a different wrinkle in there too. And uh, something that I've been particularly interested in is like, how do we really fine tune a training session? Because, uh, you know, if, if each session is now maximized, then we can stack all those up. And um, obviously that needs to be contextualized within the whole week, of course, too, right? You know, if you maximize one day, but it sabotages another day later in the week, you know, we got to consider that. But um Anyway, so I'm really interested in that question. So we'll we'll look at all those things at a meta-analysis level. But then my dissertation study is really getting into that too of fine-tuning volume, that, that sort of idea. And so what, what I'm doing is using a within-subjects design, which just means, you know, for your listeners that, that might not know, they'll have one arm, in this case, do a certain protocol, and the other arm will do a different protocol. So with that, you you effectively really increase your sample size because now we can decrease all of that like genetic variability between people, diet related variability, sleep related, right? It just everything tightens up a lot better. So, um, so that'll that'll really help to get data that's that's uh, you know a little bit more robust. So that'll be nice. Um, but what what we'll do is have one limb will always do a certain number of sets. The other limb is doing a number of sets that can change session to session based on their performance, based on the, how they feel. So that auto-regulated aspect of volume that, you know, the idea being sort of two things. One being does listening to your body, does having that auto-regulation with sets specifically lead to more growth rather than just sort of always doing what a uh, broad general recommendation might tell us to do. So just that simply is auto-regulation beneficial, but also does that auto-regulation lead us to sort of fine-tune a number of sets that are sort of individualized to that person, right? Um, so I think that, that that's very exciting to me to see, you know, what we find and, and is it something that can change or inform how we program, right, for, for different people. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. And then I guess the last little piece, which I said I was starting broad and I'm already talking for 15 minutes, but the the, the last piece of that is sort of along the way, we are collecting a lot of other subjective 
indicators. So this would be like every session we measure their, or every set, we get their pump, right? What they perceive their pump to be. We get their soreness when they come into the session, also the day after the session. We get perceived recovery status every day. We get their um, session RPE, so like how difficult they felt the session was, all these things. And we're going to be able to look at the relationship between those things and the actual growth that they get. So with that, my hope is that we get some data that helps us to sort of, you know, sift through all these things of like, which things should be really listened to, right? Like if pump is related to hypertrophy really strongly, cool, right? That, that doesn't mean it's causing growth necessarily, but it's at least something we should pay attention to. Um, and there's some relationship there, but if it's not related at all, then like, let's not, you know, things don't need to be more complicated than they need to be. Right. So, uh, I think that'll be cool too. And, and, you know, a lot of people, especially in the bodybuilding space have been using these things, pump and soreness and, um, subjective fatigue indicators to adjust set numbers. And I've done that my, on myself. I've done that with clients and it seems to work pretty well, but there's just no research on it. So I'm very much looking forward to like getting some of that research. We'll see what we find. Maybe it's cool. Maybe it's, maybe we find nothing, you know, who knows? Uh, we'll find whatever we find, but the, the hope anyway, is that, you know, something there is interesting and, and can help kind of guide us moving forward. So I'll pause there. I don't know if there's anything you want me to rabbit hole down anymore, but, but there we go. No, that's a, that's a really, really cool topic. And like you mentioned, I think you're going to have your hands full with the volume studies. Like, like you said, you can do all kinds of things in the volume space, whether it's high volume, low volume, somewhere in between. That's very, mm -hmm. very exciting. And I hope that we get into some of the volume, um, data more uh in the show um so yeah. you mentioned that let's do a size so that to do hypertrophy specific your your um dissertation at least yeah um it which is funny right because like data-driven strength is no it, the strength is in the name and everyone sort of yes that, yeah, yeah, we okay. tell more about strength um i love strength research don't get me wrong i think it's awesome it's just that um the hypertrophy space to me has always kind of been the thing that just scratches that itch a little bit more i find it a little bit more interesting just there's just more stuff going on it feels like to me i don't know uh, and they're well they're well correlated like the stronger you get potentially the more hypertrophy you'll also get and vice versa is that correct i think in general yeah i think so to to be fair the research isn't perfectly clear on that right like there there are some things that uh would suggest that um there was actually a paper uh, was this last year or the or it was either end of 2022 or sometime in 2023 um that I can't remember the lead author's name right now. Um, I could find it and send it to you after the show, but um, it was interesting. They they looked at this question, right? Like, does hypertrophy does more hypertrophy lead to more strength? And they found that it didn't. And they did. They had a really really good analysis, and they used like a an unskilled strength movement. So it was really just it's not a technique thing that's changing the strength. Sure. It's just the you know, and they found that you know really no benefit of greater muscle size. Or like that's interesting, um, but then like so much practical experience is just yeah. yeah man you know if you if you get bigger you just always seem to get stronger you know so I, yeah. I have a hard time um, I have a hard time not leaning that way that getting bigger is going to be helpful, yeah. but uh, at least in terms of the research you know we'll see what happens on years to come. You know, I get you. I, I, I agree with you on that one because um, I don't think anyone skinny is deadlifting 300 kilograms. I just don't. Like, I think I mean, there's yeah, quite there's... a lot of quite a lot of muscle to to deadlift, like incredible numbers like that. Yeah, and yeah that you really help. It's anomaly. Yeah, you, it does. It, I mean, there there's a lot of this. You know, I mean, people are just with crazy for sure leverages sure. or whatever. But by and large, if if we're making a general recommendation for people, like yeah, we should probably try to get a little bit bigger. You know. For sure, for sure. Get those numbers up. But then you got the powerlifting categories and stuff, so it all affects yes. your costs and whatnot. Yeah, so you got to think about that, right? If Especially if you're at the really high level, is it worth gaining more muscle? Or like, are you actually getting more competitive within your weight class? Or is that now going to make you struggle in the higher weight class? So it's, you know, definitely considerations for those really high level people. For sure. And in terms of the volume dose, is that um, a relationship versus your reps in reserve? I saw you got an article on that. Is that still to do with your research now or is that uh, past um, unrelated? So uh, ask that again. I want to make sure I'm understanding your question right. Uh, I saw that you have an article on the volume 
uh, versus RIR dose relationship. Oh like yeah, yeah, yeah. High end. Yes. Yeah, so the it's the the biggest thing with that whole topic. Uh, the answer is we don't know, right? That that is the answer. No, and no one knows because uh, there's just no research yeah. on it really yet, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, we we have a study in our lab that is done. We're in the analysis stage now. That um, is just one study, so it's not going to tell us a whole lot. But hopefully, can start to get some glimpses, and then as as more studies are done, that'll be helpful. Um, but we we have basically the you know the question is right like. How do those two play together? Uh, because we know it seems like more volume generally leads to more growth, at least on average. Uh, we had our meta-analysis from, when did that initially come out? Sometime last year, I think, uh, that was led by Zach Robinson in our lab that um, has it's since we have sort of a, uh, it was pre-printed. We have sort of a version two that's now been pre-printed again. Uh, so people can, it's at the same link. People can, can check that out. If you just get on Google Scholar or just Google you know, Zach Robinson, proximity to failure and meta-analysis or something like that, it'll pop up. Um, but basically that was showing dose response there as well, right? The closer you get to failure, the more hypertrophy we tend to get. Question there, of course, both of those things are more fatiguing, right? More volume tends to be more fatiguing, closer to failure tends to be more fatiguing. So we can't, probably can't maximize both at the same time always, right? Right, so now we have to decide which one do we prioritize more? Do I do less volume if it means i can take everything really close to failure or should i back away from failure so i can do more volume like what's the deal and um there's no correct answer to that yet there's no clean answer um my, my two cents currently is is essentially that we have more direct research comparing different volumes um so i i have more confidence in that relationship right, of that dose response of volume and growth compared to the proximity fil to failure one, because a lot, if people read the paper, um, a lot of those studies had to be estimated, the RIR that they were training yeah. with, right? And we feel very confident in how it was estimated, but nonetheless, I'm sure there's errors in there, right? There's going to be errors anytime something that like that is done. So um, there, there just isn't a whole lot of studies that are like failure versus this exact RIR, things like that. So limitations with that one which makes me be like i think it's a thing but i'm less confident there compared to the volume so for for me you know i, I kind of think about let's maybe prioritize volume a little bit more for now at least let's try to on average maybe get a little bit closer to failure but only so much as it doesn't create so much fatigue that is now sabotaging how much volume we can do i don't think that's super worth it um so as an example I've done this with a handful of clients now that are just focused on hypertrophy. I think if someone has strength goals as well, that complicates things a little bit because now we have more um, more reason to be cautious of fatigue. I don't want to sabotage our performance on those really heavy squat days or whatever, for example. But if someone's just focused on muscle growth, what I've tried to do a couple of times and, and have had pretty good success with so far is someone's doing a certain amount of volume and they're probably on average, maybe they're training with two reps in reserve or something, right? Just on average. So then I pulled their volume back just a little bit, maybe 10%, 15%, whatever, just a little bit of breathing room. On average, got that stuff a little closer to failure, maybe one RIR, maybe zero RIR, some stuff to failure, right? Um, let's see how that feels. And what it seems like, at least the people that I've worked with and tried this with, and um, there's a little bit of evidence for this as well, not much, very little bit, uh, suggestion, <laughs> I guess you could call it, is that initially going closer to failure is more fatiguing. But when you do it for a few weeks, you kind of adapt and it's not as fatiguing anymore. Um, I've certainly experienced this, right? Like it's just, at first it, it's like, wow, I feel like I got hit by a truck, but then after a few weeks, like I'm chilling, right? It's not that big a deal. <laughs> um, at least for most like upper body calves, right? Um, things like that. But, um, so anyway, so I tried this, I pull volume back a little bit, get things closer to failure on average, let that kind of settle and see, do they feel fine now? Right. They're not fatigued. Let me try to add that volume back in just a little bit at a time. And can we get it back to where it was? And in my experience, you know, I've been able to get things back to pretty much where they were and, um, maybe a slightly less, but pretty much where it was, which to me feels like sort of a, a best of both worlds, right? Like I'm still 
trying to get as much as I can of, of each thing, but um, still sort of my guiding principle, uh, at least as of right now, is that if that fatigue from going closer to failure starts to sabotage how much volume I can do, probably not worth it. I'm going to pull a little bit further away from failure on average again, right? You can still have some stuff that's to failure or whatever, but um, yeah, that's how I've kind of rolled with it. Um, and and just to, to put a bow on that, to, to be clear, when I mentioned like there's a tiny bit of evidence that that fatigue from going to failure seems to dissipate a little bit over time. The latest study from uh, Martin Ruffalo, who it was a great study looking at failure versus two RIR on average, uh, just came out super recently. Um, they had on one of the two exercises, they had leg press and leg extension, and I can't remember off the top of my head which one it was, but it was one of the exercises that the rep drop off over time was less pronounced, right? In in going while going to failure um, over time, right? So it's sort of like you are, or rep drop off in a session was less pronounced over time. So it's like, as the weeks went on, that fatigue from going to failure, like at first they would just tank and then they kind of were able to maintain a bit better over time. Um, and which sort of mirrors a lot of my practical experience. So, uh, but the other exercise didn't do that. They continued to tank from, from the fatigue. So, um, who knows, but we'll see as we get more and more research over the next several years. I think that's a topic that a lot of people are interested in. So we'll see what happens. Absolutely. And in terms of that RIR, is the general recommendation still zero to four reps in reserve? I, yeah, I think that's super reasonable. You know, I, I, I might tend to say maybe this is super annoying, <laughs> like uh, nitpicky, whatever, but um, I might tend to go like zero to three or something personally, if I had to put a number on it, uh, just because it, it does kind of seem like I was just saying, it does kind of seem like the closer we get to failure is probably a little bit better limitations to that analysis 100 percent, but um but nonetheless i do think there's something there um i do think that the fatigue from being closer to failure probably dissipates a bit over time for most people so uh with that i'm like for again for hypertrophy i think we can be a little bit closer on average and be fine especially if we're talking about doing you know things for your arms things that are a little, you know higher reps on average and stuff like that uh, again, if you have strength goals at the same time, I think that changes things because uh, we have to be careful with that fatigue. But with with hypertrophy, at least, that's where I tend to settle somewhere in that zero to three ish range, um, on average, at least. Right? There's still some stuff, you know. Usually, if somebody's doing sets at eight on RDLs, right? Like we can stay further from failure. It's fine. They're gonna feel super hard no matter what we do. So like things like that, especially if they cause a lot of soreness and all of that, I'll I'll feel a little bit more conservative. But the compound move. But yes, I'm just really in mind. Yeah, especially for things like RDLs, though, I, I've I've found at least that, you know, um, leg press and hack squats or Smith machine squats or things like that, I haven't had as many issues with people getting really consistently really sore. Um, I think th those hip hinges, dude, like they just um, screw up your hamstrings, you know, but um, but I think as a general principle, I, I do think that's probably true, right? Like the more uh, the more it's like a compound lift with a high technique component with uh, more muscle groups, larger muscle groups, lower rep ranges, and heavier loads. Like the more we're on that side of stuff, probably the further from failure we can we can be and then vice versa. I think it's probably a pretty good rule with them. And in terms of going past failure, do you see any benefit like um, maybe cheat reps or drop sets, myo reps, any of that? Or is it still, there's just no data to to say that it's good or bad or, or what's your take it's tough man um i i think that as far as i'm aware that it's not necessarily better than you know doing another thing like to true like true failure is gnarly you know yeah. uh like it's someone not. like you really take a leg press to failure it's crazy you know? but um the so i don't think as far as i'm aware it's not necessarily better but it's also not worse so I'm like, cool, that's just another tool we can use. It's fun to do that stuff, right? I love that stuff. There's, you know, and uh, so I, I think that's definitely something that we can keep in that toolbox to keep enjoyment and just, you know, engagement with the program and consistency and all those things. I think that's huge. I also think doing those things like the set's just so hard, right? That That in itself, I think, can be beneficial to help people like realize how hard they can push themselves. And then, um, you know, even if we're trying to 
just go to, to normal failure or if we're going to one RIR or something, they can probably push harder than they thought, you know? So having some experience there, I think can be helpful. And then, um, I think the last piece is, you know, there's something that I've been doing quite a bit of, and I think sort of is right in line with those examples that you gave would be using length and partials yeah. as an intensity technique. Um, you certainly don't have to use it as an, you know, uh, like right. Milo who, Milo Wolf, who's, whose PhD was sort of what kicked this whole thing off, right? Yeah. Um, he was on the he, he was, oh, episode two. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he's great. Um, and he, he's talked a lot about how like, it's not really an intensity technique, right? This is just the range of motion that we think it will lead to the best growth. And I think that's super valid. Um, I personally have tried using it as an intensity technique and I just like it, right? Yeah. I, I think it, it helps to, it accomplishes similar things to, you know, myo reps or, uh, things like that, where the set's just super hard and we get those things, but it also is like, you know, especially for lat pull downs and rows and things that they're, they're so hard right at that contraction, but not that hard up here. We can just squeeze more out of that same set, you know? Um, so I've liked that a lot. Clients have really liked it. You know, they, yeah, I feel like the NDSA, like you're like, actually getting more. Yeah. It's crazy. Right. And, and it's, everyone's like, man, the pumps are insane and it's just fun. Right. Uh, who knows if it's actually better or not, which and funny enough, um, Milo's meta-analysis would suggest that it's, you know, maybe not better. Um, but the, uh, I don't, I don't know. I, I think that I still, regardless of, of, of what the meta-analysis showed, I still have a, a difficult time, um, wrapping my head around that a strategy like that where we are doing a full range of motion with some length and stuff at the end to kind of hit that failure point at multiple different muscle lengths. I have a really hard time seeing that not being the best, um, but we don't have research on it, right? So it, it's one of those things that we'll have to wait and see, but um, I really like that one. I really like that one. Yeah, that, I, I like it too. It, well, like he mentioned that you can expect to get between 5 and 10% um, more growth than doing full range of motion though, when he was on maybe it's changed since then. Um, it's been a minute since I read that, uh, since I read that paper, so I couldn't tell you for sure. But, um, I mean, he pays super close attention yeah. to that area. Yeah, he does. He also did a thing uh, where he mentioned the uh, myo sets and he says that it's just not like, there's no data to support it. So he's not a fan of, of the myo sets. What, what would you say? I mean, fair enough. Yeah. Would you say the length and partials are your favorite kind of intensity technique? I know Jeff Nippert said oh, that they were one of his favorites. They're probably, at least right now, yeah, I think yeah. probably my favorite. Um, I, I like the Maya rep stuff though, personally, you know, and I think that um, the w wanting to wait for more data is totally valid, 100%. Uh, I'm, my personal opinion is that if, even in the absence of data, if there's enough logic and reason behind something, sure. then I feel very confident that it's not, you know, not demonstrably bad. worse. Yeah. You know, if, if somebody enjoys it and it, it just helps them, you know, uh, lock into the program a little bit more and, and just have more fun and they're more consistent, they keep showing up, they keep pushing themselves. That sounds like a win to me, you know? Um, and it's just, it breaks up the monotony. Bodybuilding can be so monotonous, dude. If yeah. we just, if we're doing everything by the book, it's like, you know, this is, it's, it's great, but it's, it's just a lot of the same stuff. So, um, especially for people who only have that, they don't care about strength at all. I find that really nice to be able to thread in those other little things and, and, uh, just keep that enjoyment up, you know? Absolutely. I totally, totally agree. Um, you had a really, really cool, um, thread or I guess carousel, you'd call it on, uh, Instagram about programming considerations. Do you mind if we just jump through them? I've got them open here. If you want me to read them back in case you might've forgotten about them, but I think it was your yeah, motion. Sure. I'm sure. Um, they were really cool. They were like, does the muscle act as the prime mover? Does the muscle get trained through a full wrong? Does the muscle get loaded in a stretch position? Biomechanical considerations, different rep ranges, better suited to different exercises, stimulus, fatigue ratio, that kind of thing, uh, overload potential and time efficiency. What are your thoughts on on all of those? They're, they're really cool um, programming yeah. considerations and, and I think that they're super important and it's such a nice post that, you, that you've done there. Thanks, dude. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think... And, and I should say this on the front end too, just to be clear, like, I don't think all that stuff is necessary to grow, right? Like we can still grow doing the most basic stuff. It's just, you know, when we start talking about, can I grow as much as I possibly can? 
And as people get more advanced, I think that starts to matter even more. And so then we start to, you know, talk about some of these more little tiny nuanced things that can make maybe that tiny bit of difference. But then if we stack multiple of them on top of each other, maybe we're, it, it might be the difference between growing and not growing, right? For somebody who's super advanced. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I, I think that a lot of it is also common sense of, you know, you, you just go try something and see kind of how, you know, for example, like the different rep ranges for different things. Uh, I, so funny enough, I have a, I teach a class here as part of my uh, PhD and the class is just all about lifting, right? I, I've sort of made it all about, it's, I think it's an awesome class personally. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, the class? I was so oh. I did, yeah, dude, I'm, I'm so excited because it's the, the point was the point of the class is to discuss you know, taking a lot of the physiology that they've learned in previous classes, anatomy, physiology, how do I apply that now to programming, right? How do I, you know, applications of training physiology is what it's called. Very cool. And um, so I was like, that's the, that's the guideline. Sweet. We're going to talk about lifting. We're talking about strength and hypertrophy. And, um, and that's literally one of the slides in one of the presentations is, is about this. And I show like for leg training for, or quad training. Um, common exercises we got, you know, leg press, we got, or we got squat, we got leg press, we got leg extension. And then just thinking about different rep ranges for these things. And do they make sense? So like, you know, less than 10 reps, does that make sense for squat? Absolutely. Right. It makes a lot of sense. 10 to 15 reps. Does that make sense? Yeah. It starts to get tricky with the cardio aspect, but you could do it. We're doing high, really high rep stuff. Does that make sense? I feel much less comfortable with that, right? Like the cardio, it gets crazy. We start to like, now we probably do need to get really close to failure to maximize the set. Is that really safe on a squat? Maybe if you have good spotters and you have really stable technique, but if someone's not as experienced, maybe something funky happens or whatever, right? So like squatting, I, re I really like those relatively lower rep ranges. A leg press, we can kind of do all of them, right? Heavy leg press feels pretty good. We can do moderate stuff. The cardio starts to get challenging, but it's not as technique dependent as a squat is, you know, and if we hit failure, that's okay. We're not going to fall, uh, with a barbell on our back and then like a leg extension, sort of the opposite of the squat, right? High reps are great. Moderate stuff can be great, but really high or really high lows, really low reps. People tend to get some knee pain, you know? So it's just, just, you know, I think there, there are things that when you've been lifting for a long time, like you just sort of inherently start to do these things, even if you don't think about it, just, you've noticed something makes your knee feel funny. So you don't do it anymore, you know? Um, and I think that post was trying to like take a lot of those things that a lot of us do just inherently or sort of on instinct and like just write them down basically. Right. To have sort of a, an idea uh, with that. And, and, uh, yeah, yeah. Some just, you know, and I'm not saying that this is the only right thing. People might disagree with, with me on those sorts of things, but, and that's fine, but that's at least how I tend to think about stuff anyway, is sort of using those, rough guidelines is, you know, and then you can deviate from them for sure. Right. Maybe there's a certain, you know, you're working with a certain person who has whatever circumstance or they have, they're limited on equipment or their what are injury history, all these sorts of things. And then we start to, you know, break the rules a little bit, but it fits that person and cool, you know? Absolutely. It's gotta be a uh, person specific. hundred percent. Everything does. Yeah, and it's uh, crazy, but you got so many top guys just giving cookie cutter programs, same for ten to a few thousand people, and it's like, I'm sure yeah. it's probably not even the worst program, but it's definitely not not optimal for you. For sure, I, you know, as as long as everyone is aware that that's the case, cool, right? I don't if, think if, they are. If they're like, yeah, that that I'm sorry, so be unfortunate, but if everyone knows what they're signing up for, then sweet. But, um, you know, if I don't think they would sign up. It's not. I don't think a lot of people would sign up if they thought uh, it wasn't yeah. really good. But they get tricked because they see someone influential, like, oh, 100,000 followers must be must be good. And look how they look as well. Um, oh, for, yeah, that's big, a big thing. Yeah, dude, don't even get me started on uh, my, my girlfriend and I talk about this all the time, just how, um, with how heavily driven the whole industry is by social media. Yeah. It's like, you know, depending on how somebody looks, it, it just, people make such an immediate snap judgment on the call or show what they're saying or, or, or what they're doing, or is maybe it's, maybe they are saying amazing information and it's all great, but like maybe. people none the, yeah, maybe, but people will just nonetheless assume that if I do that, I'll look like you for sure. Like that, like, no man, it, you know, um, 
so it's i've actually had i think several posts uh, you know try to be kind of uh to talk about it at least every, every once in a while about like genetics matter man and, and like it's something none of us want to talk about we don't want to think about it and i think it's very unhelpful to think about like there's literally research on you know your your expectations can change your physiology right like you, it can literally change your your results um to an extent um but like so i don't think we should ever focus on our genetics but we should be aware people are different and like if i do your program i'm not going to look like you i'm going to look like me maybe i look like me but a little more jacked or something right or or whatever and it's just so many people just and i was the same way for so long you know like that's how all of us get started we find people on instagram who look great and we follow what they're doing and then we start to learn and expand and you know so uh so yeah anyway tangent aside that's uh it's definitely it's uh it's the wild west out here man it is absolutely um just so that on a note uh with the squats or oh, guys uh always use safety pins uh just just always use safety pins. it's it's definitely yeah. worthwhile and then i just wanted to let you know and i'll probably address this again later i really appreciate your your honesty and your caution about about everything basically and not being and openly not being 100 percent certain about anything because you can't really be even if the data now shows this like yeah, that's cool, but it might change. And uh, really appreciate how honest you are about it. And it's disappointing that there's not uh, that much honesty on the internet like like yourself. <laughs> but, uh, Thanks, I, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I mean, that's why they have 200k followers and I don't, right? So um, you're gonna get them, and no, I, I definitely I don't know what you're gonna get there. It's gonna blow up. They do. Don't worry. Don't worry. Oh, for sure. Yeah, but thank you for saying that, man. It, it's uh, credit where it's due. I, I've had some very good people around me to help, you know, mentor me and, and those sorts of things. So, um, it's in, especially when you get into the talking about research stuff. Like, as you're saying, you know, even if something seems really well studied now, like there's a whole discussion now about, you know, we have all these studies on volume, right, and all these studies on on everything, really, with what's leading to more hypertrophy: volume, rest times, frequency, etc. And there, um, Sam Buckner has made a really, um, he, he's been sort of at, at the forefront of discussing this. And, um, there's been a lot of good discussions lately about, you know, the, the, how soon they take that post measurement compared to the training session. That probably matters quite a bit, you know, cause there might be some swelling that's still there. And, yeah. um, like among yeah, others, he, yeah. So there, there's, there's stuff like that where. And I, I'm, I don't think this will be the case. Uh, I don't, I personally don't think that the swelling is such a huge, it probably matters, but I don't think it's going to completely, you know, uh, overshadow all the growth that we're seeing. But, you know, let's say it did, right? That means all these volume studies, all these everything studies, don't, t we have no idea. And the body, like, you're right. So it, it's, it's, it's tough, you know, because there's always something like that that could happen. Yeah. Um, or we find there's a new measurement technique or a new device that can measure this thing way better. Or we find out we've been tracking the wrong hormone or the, or the wrong biomarker. And, um, you know, like any of that stuff can happen at any time. And, and I just, I really don't want to be the dude who gets made into a meme. So, cause there's a lot of great memes out there and I just, uh, you know, uh, I don't, I don't want to be that guy. So maybe that's what I need to blow up on 200 K there. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I, I I'm aware of the time and I know we're having such a good time. It's going so quickly. Let's just before jumping into the papers, um, let's just quickly uh talk on the rate of weight gain during hypertrophy phases. Um, and I see your post mentions about 0.5 percent, uh, 0.25 percent to 0.5 percent, and then under 0.25 percent for novice, intermediate, and advanced respectively. We just quickly touch on that, and then also losing body fat while maintaining muscle strength, training with intent, high protein slow rate of fat loss just quickly and then we'll get into the papers yeah um so the the, the weight gain one um that comes primarily from a paper i think it was 2019 from iraqi at all that um juma iraqi he, he at least used to have a really good podcast i don't know if he's still doing it or not but it used to be really cool at least uh, i'm sure it's out there on youtube or something somewhere but uh but shout out to him because he, he he was definitely a, a cool resource for me uh when i was initially starting this whole school thing but um, it, was a, it was a great paper, and, and they looked at all the, the relevant research, which isn't much, to be very clear. 
there's not a whole lot, but it's kind of seeming like these are reasonable ranges, right? Of, um, on the top end kind of being on that half a percent of body mass per week, which, you know, I, I guess to, to put a number on it, right? Like, um, if somebody weighs a hundred kilos, right? 1% would be one kilo a week. So half percent, half a kilo a week. That's still pretty fast, right? You know, half a kilo a week is like, you know, you're, you're pushing it. Um, so, and that obviously scales with, with body mass. Right. Um, and I think it would make sense for that to scale with how advanced you are as a, as a trainee that the more, the longer you've been training, probably going to gain less muscle as we go. So try to gain a little bit more slowly for the most part, some caveats to that, that I, that I always like to try to point out, um, is that the more advanced we are, yes, we're growing less muscle, right. But I can certainly see an argument that we don't want to try to go too, too slow because now I don't think we're is trying that, but I get you. Yeah. Well, I think at least I've seen a couple people at least, right. And we try to go so slow to like Matt, not get around weight gain to the muscle. Yeah. And yeah. avoid the fat yeah. gain. And I'm like, dude, at that point, it's so hard to gain muscle. Uh, I would kind of rather, you know, you don't have to get go really fast. fast, but maybe, yeah, just maybe be a, a little bit above that minimum range or something to just ensure you're growing as much muscle as you can because the the fat the fat loss in comparison is such an easier process to yeah, gain muscle. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, so th that's, that's my two cents on that anyway. And also, if you're going too slow, it's really hard to track. Like now we're trying to track a gain of point oh eight kilos per week or something like that's you know that's tough um yeah with fluctuations and everything so anyway so th that's where that post came from and and um you know trying to take that paper as the as the guide post and then layer in some of my experience and some of my two cents on on those things anyway um so there was that and then the the other piece was the um losing weight while while getting stronger right was the other piece um so if you're losing yeah, fat, I'll, 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 yes, losing fat, yeah, especially, um, which is the key. That's, that's, well, one of the keys is to not lose weight too quickly, right? Because now we're going to be higher risk of muscle loss, uh, too quickly being for the most part around 1% of body mass, probably about as fast as we want to go for the most part per week. Um, that, um, uh, yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, which is, that's from the Roberts 2020, uh, paper that they found that roughly 1% as a, as a top end, um, that, you know, I don't see why that would need to scale with how advanced you are as, as a trainee. Uh, but certainly in my experience, people who have never dieted before, we probably don't want to go too fast because it just feels really difficult for them. Right. And they might fall off and whatever. So, um, I would try to get a few successful diets under your belt that are a little easier before you try to do something extreme. But, um, and not that, you know, 1% isn't super extreme, but it's still like, like you said, it's pretty fast. So, uh, so that's one piece is not trying to lose weight too quickly. Um, not trying to be too lean for too long, I think is another piece. Some people, um, you know, especially the highest levels in powerlifting, we get people trying to like really, really thread the needle with those weight classes, you know, and, uh, and that can be great. People get super successful with that. Um, but at the same time, if we're too lean for too long and we're doing, you know, so much of this stuff, um, number one, we're, we're probably hampering our chances of muscle growth if we're trying to stay shredded all the time. But, uh, also number two, right. Just the leaner we are, it seems like probably the more likely we are to be playing with fire with muscle loss. If we're trying to lose weight while we're already like bodybuilders, right. You're, you're prepping, we're playing with fire by the end. You're probably going to lose a little bit, but, um, so that's piece number two. And then the other big thing, like you said, was that training with intent. And I always, try to tell people like train the exact same way as if you had everything at your disposal to max out muscle gain, right? Have that exact same intensity, the same drive, the same focus, all those things. Cause now they're especially important, right? We're, we're kind of playing in this overall catabolic environment. that's not super conducive to, to muscle growth, right? So we almost, um, if we can combat that as much as we can with what weapons we still have at our disposal, I think that's very worth doing. And, uh, it seems to work pretty, uh, pretty well. And I guess w one last thing that I'll, that I'll kind of toss in there on the top that I think is also seems to be helpful based on, on my experience is if we can keep, um, heavy exposures, quote unquote, make sure we still have that in there. Meaning don't go too long without touching like a pretty heavy weight. Uh, what I mean by that is maybe like, you know, um, 
a single at RPE seven or something like that, right? Um, or maybe a double or triple or something that's you know reasonably heavy. It doesn't have to be a one RM. Doesn't have to be super heavy, super fatiguing, but just something that's in that realm to make sure that we are keeping that stimulus there seems to be helpful. I don't know how to explain that on a physiological level, but it just seems to seems to generally work a little bit better than getting too far away from it. But um, yeah, that's what I think usually works pretty good. That what you mentioned there about the um, relatively high. Um difficulty like the one one rep max or not not necessarily one rep max but like seven rp or so um that i think i saw that in like the minimum dose um yeah study by the dr pack i think he's also yes. uh, i haven't released his episode yet but he's also going to be on the oh show. Yeah, he's great yeah. yeah yeah he is also great i'm an honor you got me in here with those guys that's cool mm-hmm. Bro, I've seen your, you've got photos with them already, you know them. <laughs> oh yeah, at least I saw Dr. Wolf and, and them and some of your photos. Yeah, you're a researcher. Yeah. These are the people that I want on the show, are the people doing the doing the research. And I think volume is a, a pretty good, uh, the muscle growth podcast. I think it's going to be tie in pretty well. I can't wait to see your, yeah. your final thing. When are you going to finish your research, by the way? Um, so the updated meta-analysis that I mentioned should hopefully, our goal, we're in the writing process now, so our goal is to be able to get that out sometime, I don't know, mid-2024 would be pretty sweet, like in the summer, summer at all, um, that's, that would be amazing, uh, we'll see if that happens, that, that, that's, that's the goal, but we'll see. Um, in terms of my dissertation, that's going to be longer for sure. Um, I'll probably roll with data collection until, you know, probably like this time next year. Okay. Uh, and then I'll need some time obviously to analyze and, you know, write up the paper and all that stuff. But, um, yeah. what I, what I would love, uh, and who knows if this is realistic, but what I would love is to get the meta-analysis out summer, fall of this year, and then get my dissertation stuff out, you know, a year after that. Um, maybe that's ambitious, but we'll find out. We're going to try our best. Well, we'll have to get you back on the podcast once you release that and, and publish it. That would love you. So let, I'm sorry, a last thing, and I don't want to carry on with this because we're about to get into the papers, but just, this might be a really stupid question. Um, but just huh. in terms of the, um, the body fat or the rate of loss and the rate of gain, the, based on body, like on the percentage, is that an updated percentage every week or the original like at the start of the dust is it yeah, i like to update it week. as we go okay, okay. yeah cool yeah just, All right. and it's not going to change that much right yeah yeah, yeah. it's it's not going to change that much week to week but you know if if someone lost 10 kilos or something right it's a meaning no, okay, change. It is. yeah for sure that's a really good uh Something's gone really right or really wrong for a 10 kilo. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Let's hop into the papers. To hear Jake talk about the research papers that he's been a part of, you're going to have to tune in next time for part two on the Muscle Growth Podcast. Goodbye, Gains Gurus. Thank you for listening and see you on the next episode of TMGP.